<laughs> and we are live. Welcome, everybody. If you are watching on Facebook or on YouTube, take a quick minute to say in the chat where you are watching from. And a special welcome to you if you are not watching live but watching the replay. We're really happy to have you here and excited to share some science with you today. It looks like we have people from Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Seattle, Arkansas, some from the first time. Welcome, Vegas, New York, California, Springfield, Tennessee, Spain, Spain, Houston, Florida, St. Louis, Missouri, Texas, West Virginia, Massachusetts, Canada, Louisiana, Michigan, California, New York City, Massachusetts, Texas, Pennsylvania. Wow. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. We're really excited to be here back with another episode of Quarantine. We have more than a thousand people watching right now, and we are so happy to have you here. I want to take a quick minute to introduce the other science moms. So we have a science mom squad. I have three science moms who work for me, and you'll see them in the chat on YouTube. We have science mom Emily and science mom Liza. And on Facebook, we have Science Mom Krista. So they'll be there to answer some questions and drop links if there are things you're looking for or having trouble finding. One thing I do want to point out is that on Patreon, so patreon.com slash science mom, there is a little handout for this week's, or today's, not this week. So if you go to patreon.com slash science mom, you can print out this little set of notes that goes along with what we're doing today, if you would like. Anything you wanna add before we get started? Oh, I should say, um, yesterday we were talking with the other science moms and it turns out that Emily is a little um, trigger happy about muting people in the comments. If you say the same thing several times, then she'll be like, like put you in timeout so you can't comment in the chat for um, 30 seconds. Five, right? five minutes, actually. Five minutes. Yeah. It's a yeah. So serious timeout. We'll watch out for science mom Emily. She doesn't mess around. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to say, we've been getting some amazing art submissions. You kids are so clever the way you've been finding those leprechauns to trap. I mean, I was thinking of these little tiny simple traps. You guys way outdid my expectations. Amazing. amazing. We're going right. to share just a couple, but I'm going to encourage you um, on Facebook. We made a, a post and it has it has a picture of the prompt. It says ready, set, draw. And you'll also see the instructions for yesterday's little engineering challenge um, and today's engineering challenge. So post your pictures there on Facebook so everyone can see them. We had close to 500 submissions come to our inbox and the pictures were amazing. And we shouldn't be the only one enjoying these. So post your pictures there. And we do want to share just a couple I loved, I loved this one. Thank you, Addison, for sending this one in. I love that, um, well, it's on her, written on her half birthday. I like the wooden rainbow kind of tricking him to come in, the fake gold. I like that this one has a lever that the leprechaun will go up to get the gold and then the lever will tip, putting the leprechaun into the little pool. And then we had several fantastic pictures where people would build their own leprechaun boxes too, and these were super fun. So happy St. Patrick's Day. And if you haven't already built a leprechaun trap or drawn a leprechaun trap, today's a great day to do that. That's right. And now without further ado, let's get ready for our science lesson. So here's our little schedule for today. What we'll be doing, we have a science demo about electricity because yesterday we had some fast, fantastic questions about plasma. So we'll be doing that. And then we've got a fun little fact or fiction. We have another challenge that Math Dad and I are gonna do, and then more Minecraft math, and we'll go from there. So, anyway, um, so, so fun to see all the activity in the chat. So, hello everybody who is watching, and let's, let's get started now with learning about electricity. So you guys probably already know quite a bit about electricity. You know that it is something that we use all the time to power our electronic devices, that's why we've got lights up here, indoor lighting, powered by electricity. And there are also natural types of electricity that you may have seen, like lightning. Well, today we are going to use a plasma ball to explore this phenomenon a little bit deeper. 
And if you've never seen a plasma ball before, let me tell you a little bit about how it works because these are fantastic. They are really cool creations. In the middle of the plasma ball, we have a Tesla coil. And the Tesla coil was invented by Nikola Tesla, a famous scientist that you might have heard about. And what it's gonna do essentially is get electrons really excited. It's gonna oscillate up and down, give them energy and send them out in every direction. If this plasma ball did not have this sphere around it, if we, I cracked it with a hammer and broke it open, then when we turned it on, we would see nothing. There would be nothing to see because normally excited electrons moving through air don't cause any color or anything like that. But if we have neon and argon gas in here, then when we turn the plasma ball on, we're gonna see incredible colors and that'll actually let us see how the electrons are traveling. Now, if you have never heard of an electron before, let me tell you, electrons are pretty weird. Um, they are very, very small particles. They have almost no mass, almost no size, but they have a very strong negative charge. So in the little notes that we did here, you can see that we drew our little cartoons electrons, like they're little, just a little E with a smiley face. You often see them drawn as like a little E with a little negative sign because they are negatively charged. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But first, I'm gonna ask Math Dad to turn off the lights. We're gonna dim our light a bit so that you can see the plasma ball a little bit better because when we turn this on, it's gonna look pretty amazing. And in fact, maybe if you can turn that other light so it gets just a little bit dimmer. So look at this, you can see, that's perfect. You can see that we have these tendrils of light going out in all directions. They're kind of random. And we've got beautiful pink and kind of purple colors happening. And again, that's because our electrons are not just traveling through air, they're traveling through neon and argon gas. And those gases are special because when an excited electron bumps into one of those molecules, they fluoresce, they send off, they send off light that's colored that we can see. Next, we are gonna test several materials to see which materials conduct electricity and which materials do not. Because some materials, electrons can pass through them very easily, and other materials, if a free extra electron bumps up to it, it's like, eh, I'm just gonna stay here. I can't, I can't go through this. The first thing that we're gonna test is popsicle sticks. So dry wood, do you think this is a conductor of electricity or not? If it's not, we call it an insulator. So type your answer in the chat real fast. Do you think it is a conductor or an insulator? And I can see a lot of people asking me to touch the plasma ball. We will be touching it in just a minute, but first we're gonna test some things. So if you haven't typed it in the chat yet, I'm seeing lots of good guesses. Take a minute and if you're not chatting, that's fine too, just kind of think about it. Conductor or insulator, that's what we'll be asking with each material that we test. And if it's a conductor, and we put it on top of the plasma ball, we will see a change in how the plasma ball looks. If it's an insulator, not a big change. And you guys are 100% right. Most people are saying insulator. It is an insulator. Dry wood does not conduct electricity. Next, we're gonna test rubber. So rubber eraser here, rubber eraser here. We do not see a big change. Rubber is also an insulator. It does not conduct electricity. Now I have two plastic golf tees. Golf tee here, golf tee here. No change, not a big change. Plastic is also an insulator. Next, we have metal. And I'm sure you can guess, things are gonna be a bit different with the metal. I'll put one quarter on top and then touch the other quarter to it. And we see a big change. There is a line of electricity running up. You can see that most of the electrons in the plasma ball were funneling up toward the quarters. Metal is a super good conductor of electricity. And that's why if you look at a cord, or any type of wiring, you'll see insulators and conductors paired. Here I have an old charging cord that I cut the top off because it was broken and no longer worked. And inside you can see copper wire wrapped in this kind of rubber plastic material and then wrapped in plastic again. Now, metal is a great conductor of electricity. That's why we have it in wires, but it's not as good a conductor as I am. It doesn't matter if it's my hand or two fingers and I'm like, oh, come this way, come this way. And it's like, no, no, I can't decide. I'm going back and forth. Or if I put my face on the plasma ball, every part of me conducts electricity really well. And my question for you is why? 
why am I such a good conductor of electricity? I am drawing off the charge even better than my metal quarters did. What do you think? Type your answer in the chat real fast if you are watching this live. And if not, you can leave a comment if you're watching the replay. Why am I such a good conductor of electricity? I think it must be a superpower. <laughs> it's not a superpower. It's not a superpower. If you were here with this plasma ball, it would behave the exact same way for you. In fact, Math Dad, come over to this side. Let's have a little contest. You ready? So we'll touch it at the same time. Uh, we we're both drawing off the charge. I'm seeing some great, great connections here. Several people are mentioning that we have iron in our blood, and that's true. We do have iron in our blood, but the amount of iron in our blood is quite small, and it's spread far apart because you don't have iron molecules right next to each other. They're in hemoglobin molecules that are in different cells. And most of you are saying it's the water, and it is. Water is a super good conductor of electricity. In fact, Math Dad, if you can hand me that water bottle over there, I'll show you that if I put a water bottle on the plasma ball, even though it is encased in a layer of plastic, which is an insulator, it's drawing that charge really, really well. Now, I will say real fast that 100% pure water that has no salts or dissolved gases or anything else in it at all is actually not a very good conductor of electricity. But in the real world, we never, we never find 100% pure water because if the water is by a gas, it's gonna have a little bit of dissolved oxygen in it and a little bit of dissolved carbon dioxide. So we always see water that is in, in real life, water is always a great conductor of electricity. And this is why it is so important not to let water and electricity mix together. If you are swimming in the summertime and there's a lightning storm, what do you need to do? Get out of the pool. And in the kitchen and the bathrooms in our houses, we have a law that says you have to have a special type of outlet that will shut off if too much power goes out. So this is our quick little introduction to electricity, but before we put the plasma ball away, there are two other things I wanna show you that are pretty awesome. And for you, to, for you to appreciate the first one, we need to come just a little bit closer because this is a bit small, but it's so cool. If we put one quarter on top of the plasma ball and then bring the other quarter close, free little electrons are gonna be kind of gathering up and building up a charge on that bottom quarter. And this quarter is a conductor. It does not want to hold on to extra electrons. So when the other quarter gets close, the electrons will jump from the bottom quarter to the top. And we will actually make a miniature bolt of lightning right here in my science room. Watch this. The trick is to get Close. Hopefully you can see that, it's super small. I do have a, a video on the YouTube channel where I do this and I got a better close up with my other camera. It's kind of purple and it's only about an eighth of an inch tall, so super small. And like I said, I have another video on my YouTube channel. Um, maybe one of our science moms can find a link and drop that in the chat real quick and if not, I will put a link in the description when we're all done with the live stream. But it's a really cool phenomenon to see that little tiny bolt of purple lightning. I will say though, if you have a plasma ball at home and you're all excited that you get to go and do this now, do be careful because since you're a conductor, if you put a coin on here and you're touching the coin, it doesn't hurt at all and you don't get zapped. But if you hold your finger right above the quarter, just like I did with that other coin, then a little bolt of lightning will go to your finger and you will end up with just a tiny little spot of um, black on your finger from where your skin got singed a little bit. It's very superficial and it'll you know wipe off within, within a few minutes as long as you don't hold it for too long. But do be careful for that. You don't wanna get zapped by the lightning. So touch the quarter with confidence and then it will just feel a little bit warm maybe, but you won't get zapped. Now the next thing that I want to point out is that electrons typically are invisible. They're small energetic particles that we can't see and they extend beyond this plasma ball. In the middle of this plasma ball, we have our Tesla coil and that Tesla coil is sending out this excited stream of electrons in all directions, but they don't just stop when they get to the edge of this sphere. They keep going. 
There are excited electrons right here where my hand is, but I can't feel them. I can't see them. The only way that I can prove to you that they are there is by bringing a light bulb close. And this is not some sort of magic trick. This is really happening. The light bulb is here in my hand. And then if I bring it close to the plasma ball, it lights up. And if I touch it to the plasma ball directly, it lights up just about as brightly as if I just bring it close. If I touch the bottom part here to the plasma ball, it doesn't light up nearly as brightly as if I just get the coil close. And the reason why this light bulb lights up is because it's a fluorescent bulb. And fluorescent bulbs are full of a gas that gets excited and glows when electrons go through that gas. But you can tell from the color that the gas inside this bulb is not neon and argon. Because if it was neon and argon gas, we would be seeing this same beautiful sort of pink purple color. The gas inside this light bulb, actually I wanna ask you guys in the chat right now. So if you're watching the replay, you can just kind of take a minute and make a guess. If you're in the chat, what do you think this gas is inside this bulb? I'll give you a little hint. It is poisonous. That's why it's a big deal if a fluorescent bulb breaks. You want to be careful with how you clean it up. I'm really curious. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Nathan wants to know. What is the gas? So tell me, what poisonous gases do you know? Uh, carbon monoxide. Not carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide. Oh, I see several people got it. It is mercury. You are right. There is mercury gas inside these light bulbs. And that's why if a fluorescent light bulb breaks, you want to get back right away. Because in the gaseous form, when it's a gas, if you were to breathe that in, that would be dangerous. It doesn't stay a gas for very long. And there's a very small amount of it. But make sure if you ever have one of these break, that you clean it up the right way. And... I never get tired of doing this. Like, isn't that amazing? I could just play with this all day. If we have an incandescent light bulb, the incandescent light bulb will not work at all. I saw a great question someone asked, could you charge your phone using this? No, you cannot charge your phone on a plasma ball. There's not enough power. These plasma balls you can get at Walmart or Target or on Amazon, and they're not very expensive. And the reason that they are sold as novelty lights, kind of like a lava lamp that you could just put in your room and have as decoration, is because they are quite safe. The overall amount of voltage that we have here is pretty low, which means that you can't really hurt yourself with it. But it also means that there's not enough power to do something like charge a phone or to even power an incandescent light bulb. These light bulbs require a lot more energy than a fluorescent light bulb. I'm gonna ask Math Dad to turn, oh, but before we turn on our lights, I wanna say one more thing about the plasma ball. This is the last thing we'll do before we turn the lights back on. So this plasma ball has an on and an off switch, like a lot of things do. And most of our devices, when they have an on and an off switch, really what we're doing is disconnecting wires because the excited electrons that are I'm getting from the outlet in my wall here, that electricity is flowing up through the wire into the plasma ball and it's making the, all the light that we see. And if I turn the off switch, then those wires are disconnected so that the electricity is no longer flowing. But this plasma ball has a really cool in-between switch. So this is off, this is on, and this is barely disconnected. The wires are just hovering apart, but they're not far apart. And that means the little vibrations will cause the plasma ball to turn on. So if you tap it, it will turn on. And it's really quite fun to do this. My favorite thing to do is to see if you can clap and make it turn on because sound is a vibration too. So let's see if Math Dad and I together can clap loud enough to get it to turn on. Very nice. And now we'll turn the lights back on and I wanna take time to answer just a couple questions. If you have a question about what we just did in the chat, oh, help me out, the wheel's caught. There we go, got my cart back. And there is just a slight delay between um, what, what we're doing here and then what happens on YouTube and Facebook. So it will take just a second before I see your answers, but any questions? Oh, what, uh, I see that Speedy Coder asks, 
what if it was stronger? What if it was a much more powerful plasma ball? Could you charge it? I'm not sure about that, actually. I know that there are more powerful plasma balls that sometimes you will see in science museums, but I think the way that the charge is coming out, I think it would be hard to gather it and actually use it to charge a phone. So my guess is no, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Good question. Any other questions? What is inside the, oh, what's the biggest plasma ball? I am not sure. What is inside the Tesla coil? I would have to look up really quick and see exactly how the Tesla coil works. I know it was invented by Nikola Tesla. And if you're looking for a research project today to dive a little deeper, I would highly recommend reading about Nikola Tesla. He was a fascinating inventor. And he and Edison sort of had this race with discovering more about electricity that was really cool to, um, really interesting to see how that played out. How exactly the Tesla coil works, I would actually have to research to find out. I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that it does alternate that current of electricity up and down and excite the electrons. What would happen if you have a little water and touch the plasma ball? If your skin is a little bit wet and you touch the plasma ball, it's not very much different than if you touch it with a dry hand because um, the charge, overall charge that's coming out is pretty mild. The plasma ball does feel warm if you touch it and then leave your hand on it for a long time. It will start to feel quite warm underneath, but that's really it. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it zaps you or anything like that. Um, what about a drop of water on the top? A drop of water on the top, um, it might make a little bit of a sizzle sound or I've actually never tried that. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it would do much if it was just one drop. If you submerge the entire plasma ball in water, I think you would break it. Um, I don't recommend doing that. Um, one more question. Ooh, can you create a stronger electric charge if you had two plasma balls that were next to each other? That is a great question. I don't think that you would get much of a cumulative charge because again, although the plasma ball looks very impressive, the overall amount of like voltage that we have is actually pretty small. But uh, that makes me curious. Now I kind of want to go and get another plasma ball and try putting two of them together because I've never tried that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I suspect it might increase it a little bit if you like, held the light bulb right between them. Possibly, possibly. Another question was, what would happen if we put, if I put my hair on it? Not much. My hair is dry and it's made out of protein. And just like dry wood is not a very good conductor, dry hair would not be a very good conductor either. And then another question, and this one was a great one, is what gas is in this light bulb? This light bulb works very differently than our fluorescent light bulb. The fluorescent light bulb works because you have mercury gas inside, and then when the electrons flow through it, they make that gas get all excited and glow. This one works in a really different way. There is a small wire inside, and electricity, when it flows through that small wire, it makes that wire get so hot that the wire glows. We call that little wire the filament. And so there's, I, I don't know, if there's a special type of gas in here. Argon? I have no idea. It would make sense that they would not want oxygen in this light bulb. They wouldn't want to have any type of glass, gas in here that would be flammable or combustible, but I don't, I don't know if it's just straight nitrogen or if they try and do something else, I'm, I'm not sure. That's a great question too. Okay, now we are going to move on to talking about static electricity. We just talked about current electricity, all of the things that we tested, you know, materials that conduct electricity will conduct electricity, electrical current and materials that do not conduct electricity. But the materials that are insulators, they have a really cool property of being able to build up a static charge. So I'm going to get a balloon. And because I worked in a scientific lab for several years and wore latex gloves every day, I have a slight latex allergy. If I put on latex gloves, I'll get a rash. So I'm putting on mittens before I touch the balloon, but if you're doing this at home and you have balloons, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about having mittens. So I'm gonna pick up a balloon. And if I rub this balloon on a fuzzy blanket and give it a charge, then some really interesting things happen. And I guess first, here, Matt, why don't you come and rub this on my hair? I was gonna try and rub on Matt Dad's hair, but he doesn't, doesn't have enough. So the friction between my hair and the balloon 
is creating a bit of a charge on our balloon. And really one, one fun way to think about it is that we are getting, and it's hard to see with the dark background behind me here. I'll be right in front of this. And then don't get on my face. Straight up, go straight up. But you gotta try and get, oh, move this way. There we go, you can see the hair sticking to the balloon. And the hair is sticking to the balloon because when we had that friction, we were getting electrons from my hair to transfer to the balloon. The balloon built up a negative charge. And if you rub a balloon on a fuzzy blanket and get enough of a charge on that balloon, it will stick to a wall. Or a person. Come here, Math Dad. <clears throat> Stand still. I'm very attractive. <laughs> you are very attractive. <laughs> there is no glue on this balloon, no tape or anything. Stay here for just a sec. It is sticking simply because it is charged. And so anything that is a conductor of electricity, this balloon will be attracted to and will want to stick to. And if we have something that is a conductor of electricity, like an aluminum can, that aluminum can will have an attraction to our balloon. So if you can turn the view this way just a little bit, I'm gonna grab this little aluminum can here, stick it on top of our box. And now, if we get the balloon close to it, well, it looks like my charge, I don't have quite enough charge. I'm gonna rub it and charge it one more time. And I'll also move these light bulbs out of the way so hopefully it's a little bit easier for you to see. Come on. Should we move down to the ground? Oh. It's a little uphill if I try to go that way. So our can was having a hard time, but you can see that it rolled off, it rolled following the balloon. Let's let's do move down to the ground and we'll do one one shot so that you can just see see this if you're on a flat, smooth surface, because my box is not very flat and smooth, and you charge your balloon, then you can be like, come here, can, roll this way. Nope, change my mind. Roll this way. Oh, come back, roll this way. And this is this is a lot of fun to do. All right, back up top. So you can make a can roll without even touching it by just bringing a charged balloon close. But one of my favorite things to do with static electricity is to make an orb of tinsel float. And for this one, I thought it would be fun if we turned this one into a little challenge. So I'm gonna give Math Dad a little orb of tinsel. Tinsel is thin strands of plastic and these are tied together at one end with a knot and then at the other end with a knot. So there's Math Dad's orb of tinsel. And then I have an orb of tinsel, and we will move this plasma ball over to the side to give us just a little bit more room. And then we're gonna see who can float their orb of tinsel the best. Because if we get our balloons charged enough, and then we drop the tinsel right on top, then it will rep repel, it'll charge the tinsel as well and repel it, and the tinsel should float. All right, so Math Dad thinks he's ready. I'm going to charge my balloon as well by rubbing it on this blanket. And back up a little bit more so hopefully you can see us both. Whoa. Here we go. <laughs> Matt Dad won that one for sure. <laughs> Nicely done. Everyone give him applause. <laughs> Mine flew right into the cloth. Oh, I thought we were doing the transfer. It didn't work. I wasn't ready. Well, and see now the second time we try and put the balloon on the, the tinsel on the balloon, it just sticks. And I know that might be kind of hard to see with the light, but you've got to charge it again to get enough charge that you'll have extra electrons that will transfer onto the balloon and then make it levitate up into the air. So we're going to see if we can pass it from Math Dad to me. He's going to get the orb floating, and then I'll see if I can. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, i got to charge my balloon. All right, all right. I mean, so that thing's floating good 15 inches above my balloon, at least a foot. You're off the screen. Oh, uh, yeah. <gasps> no, don't hit the wall. It will stick to the wall if it hits. It will. If it gets too close to the wall or too close to the ceiling, it will stick. Can you see it? Yeah, so I think it's, now it's, it's floating up, like in it's between up near the top bars. of the screen. All right, you there, got it. Yeah. Ooh, let's see if we can go like in between. Can we hold it in between? <laughs> <laughs> we lost it. Now, I am sure there is probably at least one parent in our chat who is thinking, 
yesterday my kid was mad because I didn't have purple cabbage and dry ice on hand. And today you're telling me they have to have tinsel? No fair. Let me show you a really easy substitution that you probably do have at home. It is a produce bag. So if you have a produce bag, you can take scissors and you can cut a little strip out. So I'm just gonna cut off the top of my produce bag, just like that, cut the top off. And then I'm gonna cut a piece that is maybe, I don't know, maybe an inch thick, whoops, and probably drop it on the floor. There we go. Now I've got my loop of plastic. And the key with this one is that you have to charge both. You can't just drop it on the balloon and expect it to float. You have to actually take this plastic and then rub it on the, the blanket or the cloth or your hair or whatever you're using to charge. So Math Dad has charged that balloon. And then I am going to take this piece of plastic and very carefully kind of rub it to try and give it some charge. Keep rubbing to make sure that I get some good, some good friction with the fuzzy blanket with all of it. And now we'll see, we'll see how good your skills are. Whoa. Woo, it's like a halo around the balloon. Isn't that awesome? So if you have a produce bag, you can just take that produce bag. And the nice thing about this is that you can make multiple little halos to float with a balloon with just one bag. You can cut a lot of different strips off and use a balloon, just rub it on something to get it to charge. And these will float for a long time. It's a lot of fun. Should we try transferring this one? All right. I think this is going to be even more challenging. Yeah. So I'm going to rub my balloon. So you'll, you'll notice this one's not floating nearly as high. It's, but it's a much heavier thing we're trying to float. But. Okay, here we go. Ooh. I got it. I got it. All right, see if I can give it back to you. Uh, now I'm going to take it. God. <laughs> <laughs> so that... That is our science lesson for today. Epic, electric, I hope you enjoyed it. And real quick, I'll take just a few comments before we turn it over to the next thing on our schedule. So I'm gonna come over here, take a few questions. Math Dad's gonna set up our challenge for the day, our engineering challenge. One question I saw was, can it float higher? How high it floats all depends on how much charge you have. And the amount of charge you get is going to depend on a couple different things. One really important thing is the humidity. If you are in Florida and it is raining, I am sorry to say, but a lot of these static activities like putting the balloon on the wall and floating that little piece of plastic from the produce bag, they probably won't work because when it's really humid, it's difficult for a static charge to build up. How does it float? It floats with static electricity because if you have two things that are insulators, they can each develop extra electrons on their surface that produce a negative charge. And if one of them is very, very light, like that little strip of plastic, then the charge is strong enough that they'll repel each other. Just like magnets, you know, negative and negative repel each other, positive and negative attract. It's the same thing happening with our tinsel orb and with the little strip of plastic from a plastic bag. Couple other questions. I did see a couple questions about coronavirus, and I will say, I have a video called um, Five Things Every Kid Should Know About the Coronavirus, and I have a video on pandemics, Five Things Everyone Should Know About a Pandemic. So I'd encourage you to check out those videos, but in this in this daily live stream, our focus is gonna be on, on other things. What state of matter is light? Oh my goodness, I love this question so much. What do you think, Math Dad? Oh boy, some, <laughs> something, wave particle, something, something. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a professor in college who once started off a lecture saying that if anyone thinks they understand light, they are either the most brilliant person in the world or they don't know how stupid they are because nobody, nobody understands light. Light is a mystery. Um, and I thought that was sort of a funny way to begin a lecture, but on a more serious note, the particle, the fact that light is both a particle and a wave is really sort of a strange thing and light is quite mysterious. Um, do I have merch? <laughs> I do have a red bubble store. So if you wanna get a Science Mom Squad hoodie, you can find one there. Why do all of you like Roblox so much play real games? Oh, you guys are funny. 
Um, I have to say Roblox and Minecraft are super, super popular. Another comment, what if balloons were in zero gravity? That is a great question. In zero gravity in the space station, you could still build up a static charge. And I think that it would be more, it would appear to be more powerful because if you had static charge and then that balloon repelled a tiny little piece of plastic, instead of just going up and hovering, it would just move away and kind of keep moving away because there wouldn't be gravity to keep it, to have that attraction. Where is plasma on Earth is a great question. So, and I'm gonna answer this one real quick and say just a little bit about plasma, which is often called the fourth state of matter. And then we're gonna move over to our next activity, which is our challenge. So plasma is something that exists with electricity and with lightning. So you have a solid, and remember from yesterday, solid is our atoms are close together, they're kind of locked together. And then you have a liquid where they're close together, but they're moving around freely. And then you have a gas where they have lots of energy and they're far apart. But in each of those states of matter, the atoms are um, whole, for lack of a better word. You have your proton and neutron in the middle, and you have your electrons orbiting around the outside. In plasma, you have the electrons being kind of separate from the atoms. And so you have these now positively charged cores of the atoms, and they're in a sea of negative electrons, and it produces some really cool stuff. So plasma, that's in a nutshell, that is what plasma is. One other last question I'm gonna answer before we move to our next activity is, would a plastic grocery bag work? I have not had very good luck with plastic grocery bags. They tend to be a little bit too heavy. So I would say look for something that is a little smaller, a little thinner, like our, where did our produce bag go? Like our produce bag. So these sacks that you see in the grocery store for produce, they are quite a bit thinner than the ones that you get that you can carry groceries with. And a little bit of weight makes a big difference when we're trying to levitate something and have it lift up above using just the static charge. All right, I'm gonna come over to our banner real, our little schedule real fast. So this was our science demonstration, static electricity. And now we are ready for our engineering challenge. So the engineering challenge for today, oh, Math Dad just pointed out to me. He's like, no, no, it's fact or fiction time. Good catch, Math Dad. So Math Dad, come over right. here. So, so leading up to this, yesterday we did a fact or fiction and one of the questions involved the number of times you could fold a piece of paper. So the there, question, there was the most awesome fact checking from you guys in the comments. Yeah, I really liked the People didn't just believe us. They're like, wait a minute, let me look that up. Let me check. Yes. That is the way to become a good scientist. You need to ask questions and you don't just blindly trust. You're like, okay, I need to learn more. So something there doesn't match what I what I understand. Or oh, that seems a little suspicious. Or maybe there's some other cool idea. I'm and, sorry, I interrupted you. I want to give a special shout out to Merlin Hall, who sent us an actual video where he folded a piece of tissue paper. Was it 11 times? No, no, the tissue paper, tissue I think paper got nine times. Nine times. Yep. Yeah, he folded a piece of tissue paper nine times. The tissue paper was thinner than this paper, and it was wider, so he was actually able to fold it nine times. That's right. So if you if you don't use paper that's quite as thick, that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, and another viewer shared a Mythbusters episode. So if you just do a search for Mythbusters and paper folding, they got this giant piece of paper and they were able to fold it up 11 times, I believe, so. But a piece of paper that is this, standard eight and a half by 11, can't go more than seven. That's right. Well, and there were even some clever kids who oh, yes, were, this is my favorite. folding just the, this corner and that corner. So they, yeah, they were folding like, on top of each other. Yeah, they were just, you didn't say that you had to fold it in half each time, and that's exactly right, we didn't. So, nice catch. Oh. All right, you, you've got fact and fiction for me now? Yeah, yeah. All right, <clears throat> first question. Fact or fiction, true, 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 false. Venus is the only planet that spins clockwise. Ooh, Venus is the only planet that spins clockwise. Everything else spins counterclockwise? It sounds kind of cool to me, although I have no idea why that would be. Why would Venus spin differently than the rest? Because they're all like, they all kind of formed in the same way. It seems like they all should spin the same way. Huh. Mm. All right, I'm going to say false. It's true. It's true. Why is yeah. it true? Do you know? 
Uh, I, I don't actually know why it's true. And also, it's kind of a weird question because in space, if, if you're looking at something that's spinning so clockwise. <laughs> that's right. It all depends on your orientation, Yeah, then, then right? you should go down underneath it and you look at it and it's spinning counterclockwise. <laughs> so, so my question when I read this was like, wait a minute. What's clockwise? What's counterclockwise? Yeah, like from which point of view? Or... Yeah, so, so, so I think they're just defining the north direction to be more the way the earth is oriented. Yeah. So using that orientation when you're looking down, what you're seeing is all the planets spinning clockwise except for... For Venus. No, no, I just said that backwards, didn't I? Only Venus is spinning in the clockwise direction. Every other planet is spinning in the counterclockwise direction. But from north or south. From 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 above, yeah. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, the sun would rise in the reverse direction, and that, that would be a little bit weird. But the solar system is really cool because you've got the the Earth spinning around the sun, and you've got the moon spinning around the Earth, and yeah. for that matter, our whole solar system is spinning around a lot of motion. Yeah, the center of our galaxy, and yeah, there got circles around circles around circles. So there's some fun math involved in, in that type of thing. Awesome. All right, so 0 for 1, science one. Question number two. Babies have about 100 more bones than adults. Wow. Um, I do know that babies have more bones than adults because your your skull, when you're born, like because when you come out of the birth canal, like they shift over each other and there's molding. So there's that that changes. And I think wrists, I think our wrists and our ankles, I think there are more bones when we're young and then they like merge together. That's what I think. What do you guys think at home here? Ooh, well, so everybody most, says Most people true. are saying true. Right. I, I'm going to say true. You're going to say true yeah, as well? Yeah, I'm trusting these guys. All right. You, together, you, you get it right. Yes. Um, so I, I also saw very different numbers, as many as 305. Most places just said about 300, some as low as 270. For whereas total number of bones for a baby. For, for a baby, whereas for a grown-up, it's 206. So I, I think they start fusing together at a pretty early age. Awesome. So, all right. What's our next one? All right. Up next, the rainforests produce one half of the world's oxygen. I'm going to say false because I am pretty certain that most of our oxygen is actually produced from algae in the ocean. I'm not 100% certain on that, but I do remember. So when the, there were the fires in the Amazon, I remember thinking that the Amazon produced like 20% of the world's oxygen. And then I remember seeing some legitimate debunking of that, that the Amazon's super important for how much oxygen it produces, but it doesn't produce that much. You are so correct. I'm saying false. It, it, is, it is false. Okay. So I, I also came across a bunch of articles that were trying to address that exact question. And I think that the usual claim is that more around 20%, but I, it's functionally going to be a much lower. And it did say it was coming from the oceans. I didn't actually algae. know what that meant. It's just algae? Is algae. That all was? Oh. <clears throat> yep. Small but mighty. Very, very impressive algae. All right. All right. And so cyanobacteria too. Of course. You can't forget the cyanobacteria. No, you can't. No. no. All right. True or false. An apple is 25% air and that is why it floats on water. Ooh. So I know ice cream has a significant proportion of air. And when they're making ice cream, that's actually one of the things they measure because if ice cream didn't have any air in it, it would be so hard when you tried to scoop it out, it would be like a rock. Um, but then the more air they put in it, the cheaper it is for them to make. So there's like regulation for how much air you can have in ice cream and still call it ice cream. So air inside apples actually sounds fairly reasonable to me, even though we don't normally think of apples as being like having holes inside, it's just like really small. And if you dehydrate an apple, you're mostly taking out the water but it's kind of like spongy still. I'm going to say yes, true. That's also true. Woohoo! Yeah, so you got, you got three out of four there, science mom. Well, well done. So from, from what I was reading, 25% might have been a little higher than most of the other estimates, but yeah, significant portion of that apple is indeed air. Is indeed air. That's pretty cool. Oh. All right, now we're ready for the, the engineering challenge. That's right, and I actually don't know the rules. I don't, I'm not even sure what we're doing here. It's going to be... Kind of a surprise. All right, I'm going to show us a picture real fast. And um, I would encourage everyone, if you want to see a video of this in action, you can head over to Raspberry Rockets on Instagram. And there's a fantastic little video of these dinosaur feet walking. But I think it'll be even more fun for Math Dad if he doesn't hasn't seen it happen before and just has to sort of go on this assumption that we're going to get these feet to walk. What oh. do you think? Oh, yeah, it looks easy. <laughs> 
So all you need for this really are something round. So we are gonna be using, and I'll bring the view over here so you can see better. We're gonna be using these rolls of tape because we have two rolls of masking tape that are about the same size. Although I suspect that a roll of duct tape or something that's a little thicker is probably gonna work better. And then we also have these dowels. Oh, and we forgot to get paper. Will you grab us some paper? Yep. And we don't have any plastic straws, so we are going to make paper and just wrap it around to make a straw to go around the outside of the dowels. There are lots of substitutions you could use for this. And while Math Dad is running to grab our paper, I do wanna say one thing real quick about the length of our quarantine live stream. We did a little um, chat on Facebook yesterday with parents just asking for feedback. And there were quite a few parents who said, you know, my, my kid is six or seven years old and two hours is just too long. By the time they get about halfway through, they're ready to get up. And this is one of the reasons why we have the engineering challenge in the middle, because if you feel like you've been sitting for a long time, the great thing about a live stream that goes to YouTube and to Facebook is that you can just pause it. So you can pause this after the engineering challenge. You can go make your own rolling feet and then you know do other activities and then you can come back and finish the rest. But the important thing here is that we want quarantine to be really good and useful for you. We want it to be something that you enjoy and we want you to use it however is best for you, whether that's watching the entire thing, watching half, or just coming in to watch your favorite part, however is best for you. All right, Math Dad has our paper. And now we will get, we will get to work. Okay. Where's that picture? <laughs> so the first thing that we're gonna want to do is make some feet, and we're gonna make our feet out of these macaroni and cheese boxes, not my sponsor. <laughs> So, you use what you've got. You do. You use what you got. You do want to have something thicker than paper for the feet, but any type of cereal box, cardboard box, cardstock, anything like that should work. Cool. All right. The box is tougher than me. All right. And All right. So, so you want to make feet? I'm gonna draw mine first so I cut them out because I think that'll be easier. You can freehand yours if you want, whatever. whatever. No, 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 I, I was gonna uh, draw it, of course. I was just seeing if I could goad you into uh, cutting it without drawing. Um, I'm gonna do a little leprechaun feet. But the the one that Raspberry Rockets did was um, dinosaur feet, super cute. You can do any type of feet you want. Although I gotta say, my, my leprechaun feet look more like peanuts than feet, but that's all right, we'll go with it. You know what I just realized? I can fold it in half and then I can cut them out oh, the same. Multitasking. Yeah, look at me. Good job, science mom. So are you gonna sing songs again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm singing a song, I don't know the <laughs> words, that one. Don't I don't song. know the words to this song, boom, boom. I'm singing it loud, and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song, no, I don't know the words to this song, boom, boom. For the record, Matt's dad made that song up himself on a really long car trip we took one time. Yeah, it's, it, it is not science mom's favorite song. So. <laughs> So the perfect one to rattle her in the middle of our competition. It, it's a cute song. It just gets really stuck in my head. That's what makes it good. good you know it's good. It wouldn't get stuck <laughs> if it were not a good song. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long. But I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. All right, now you've really got it in my head. <laughs> All right, I've got my, my feet, little leprechaun feet. How are your feet coming? Oh uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have even tried to draw them. I did <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time to make straws. If you have plastic straws that will fit around um, a pencil or a wooden dowel, because you can use anything for these 
for these things that we're going to attach to our leprechaun feet, it can really be anything. Well, can pencil, I, can we just pencil, attach, dowel. Attach these, or do we need a straw? This is a perfectly good. This this is great, but you need to have something that will rotate. Oh. Yeah, something around the outside of this that will rotate. Okay. Okay. So. Now you know. There's, there's some mechanics going on here. Yep. That... This is why it's an engineering challenge. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Singing a song, but I don't know the words. <laughs> I don't know the words to the song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it way too long. I don't know the words to the song. No, I don't know the words to this song. Boom, boom. All right. So I think we should do a story while we're making this. And I think maybe you should tell one of our kids favorite stories. Oh, I know which ones those are. All right, so let me tell you the time, about the time when I was about eight, nine years old, we were coming together for family breakfast and we were eating Raisin Bran. We sit down and my mom's working in the kitchen while the kids sit to eat because we're getting ready for school. It's always a scramble. So, all right, hurry up and eat kids. Well, I look down at my Raisin Bran, I go to take a bite and my raisin moved. Like it took a step and, and I just sat there. What just happened? And I went in close again. It took another step. It was a spider. Was like, mom, 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 mom. It's a spider, a spider in my raisin bread. And she, she came over and she looked at this thing. Ah, just, it's, it's a raisin, just eat it. This little spider was, it was like sugar, just like one of those raisins in the raisin bread. And was like, well, I knew this was a spider. I was not eating that. So she goes back and mom, and then got to move again. Mom, 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 mom. And she came back and looked again. Still, she doesn't believe me that this is a spider because it looks just like a raisin. Well, finally, I got my older brother over there and he saw it move as well. And then we're both freaking out. Mom, mom, mom. She's over there. Eat it. Eat it. You're, you're grounded. <laughs> my own mother, my mom, who loves me, but she was like, eat that. Eat that or you're grounded. Because oh. she thought it was a raisin. She, she, she did. She did. And uh, no, it was not a raisin. It was a spider. Finally, she bumps it with the spoon and it moves. And she screams, ah, it's a spider. I'm like, yeah, mom, we've been telling you that. Oh, man. So I did not eat my raisin bran that morning. <laughs> for that matter, I did not eat raisin bran for a decade. <laughs> ah. I, I like it again now. Boy, it took a long time. So. Parents, listen to your kids. Don't don't ever make, make them eat a spider. A spider. If they're, if they're claiming that their food is a spider, you, you don't make them eat it. <laughs> just, just parenting 101. I decided to upgrade because I'm not sure how well this one's going to roll. Oh, it rolls okay. That's but right. that's I'm going to do the duct tape. Right. So I've got my little dowels, and now I'm going to put on my paper straws that I made. You taped your papers? I did. Oh, clear tape. Oh, see how well, sneaky she was? She was hoping I wouldn't notice. That's why I asked you to tell the story. I was distracted. Yeah, because then I would lose the challenge because I didn't know about the secret tape. This is double-sided tape. Ooh, fancy schmancy. Wait, are you telling so me? So you want it on the inside. Oh, no wonder it was hidden. Yeah. It's literally double-sided tape. Okay. Man, but yeah, to, to this day, I tease my mom about this, and she, she can't say anything. She just has to say, yeah, I know, I'm guilty. I tried to make you eat a spider. It's pretty funny. Yep. Yeah. He, he didn't eat raisin bran for years. Oh, couldn't. He'll eat it now, though. Yep. But couldn't eat it for years. All right, my creation is done. What? She didn't have to tell a story. That's true. I didn't tell a story. Okay. So, what am I doing? Um, okay, so attach that. Uh, right. this, That's it there. this makes sense. I'm okay. going to check the comments real fast while you are finishing yours. And I'm going to share a joke because we have a couple fun jokes that Science Mom Krista put together for us. So, first, real quick. Oh. <laughs> And yes, you can use regular straws if if you have them, for sure. And that's the easier way to do it. We just, I didn't have any straws. So we're making our straws out of paper. Great. 
<laughs> Some fantastic comments about the spiders. I think people liked your spider story. And now we have a joke. So Math Dad does not know these jokes. We're going to see if he can guess. What kind of music do planets sing? What kind of music do planets sing? Huh. Uh, solar music? I don't know. What, what type of music do planets sing? Neptunes. Ah, Neptunes. You ready for another one? I'm ready. What kind of key opens a banana? What kind of key opens a banana? A monkey. Yep, a monkey. Good job. Oh, yeah. Another joke. What did the judge say when the skunk walked into the courtroom? What did the judge say when the skunk walked into the courtroom? Something about a stinky smell. I don't know. Odor in the court. <laughs> Odor in the court. All right. That's clever. <laughs> I've got two more. No, I've got one more. What does a nosy pepper do? What does a nosy pepper do? What does a nosy pepper do? Uh, so peppers are spicy. It gets so jalapeno business. Oh, I was going to say it's a, it a spy or spicy. Or it's jalapeno business. Jalapeno business. That's, that's good. I, I think that one was my favorite. I liked that one a lot. So <laughs> you can clap for science mom, Krista. She found those for us, and I thought they were fantastic little jokes. Do you see my other stick? Um, You're missing a stick. I'm missing a stick. There you go. I think I took it. Sorry. Uh, you know, <laughs> sabotage. That's how. That's how she's coming out on top here. Um, I'm seeing a couple people sharing some jokes in the chat now, which is which is great. If you have a joke that you would like us to feature, um, I will make a little kid-friendly joke thing and put it on Facebook, and you can share your joke there. And I will say, once you, if you do this walking feet challenge. Um, you can go to Facebook and I have a post that says engineering challenge on it and it has this graphic and you can put your picture there and we'll add it to an album on Facebook so that then you can see everyone else's creations. You could also put it to post it to Instagram and share it with the hashtag um, quarantine or um, science mom squad would be a good hashtag as well. You could use that one share it on Instagram with those hashtags, and then you can see everyone else's creations that they are engineering and making. Math Dad is scrambling to get his finished. So okay. I win for time completed, and now it's time to see how they roll. So for this part. I, I think it's clear who's gonna win for beauty. So. <laughs> I don't know, you gotta look at these, look at these little leprechaun feet. Aren't they cute? They even have a buckle. Now, I think that we are, what we should probably do is just try going from this side forward. I'll roll mine and then you'll roll, roll yours because we don't have room to do a race. We I'm need gonna, more space. I'm gonna aim this a little bit lower. Okay. Ready, set. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, try out yours. All right. So I, I think I needed longer feet after seeing what, what happened there. Maybe I should have taped my dowels so they go straight, but, but you know, 2020 hindsight. All right, here it goes. Oh, man. <laughs> Already fell off. All right, here it goes. And it stopped. Oh! <laughs> mine, mine is still intact. It looks like one of your dowels fell off. So I think we can clearly declare mine as the winner. And what I think we should definitely do now is get a shot from the front so they can see better the way that it's rolling. Okay. So we will roll it towards the camera this time. These are really quite fun. And there's something about the motion as they go that kind of cracks me up. And I have to say, oh, it's much better that way. All right, we're going this way this time. Yeah. Look at that. You've been walking wrong your whole life. I You're have. supposed to so go backwards. You're supposed to go backwards. 
<laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Who is ready for Math Dad to do the Minecraft mystery? So you can find out the answer to last time's mystery. And then he's got another Minecraft mystery ready. So let's give a little round of applause for Math Dad here. Okay, so last time I posed a question that had to do with finding the number of blocks that we would need to finish tiling a um, pool. So if we're building a pool in Minecraft, how many blocks would go around the outside? And what we decided, so real quick, was that if it was a one by one pool, there were actually eight blocks around the outside. If it was two by two, we needed 12 blocks. If it was a three by three pool, ooh, in that case, we needed 16 blocks around the outside. Oops. And then I left it open. What if it was a four by four? What if it was more? And we decided to make up a variable that would describe things. So we used n for the size of the pool. So the, really, it's an n by n pool. So one by one, two by two, three by three. We were only looking at the square pools, although obviously there are lots of variations on that that you could do. Oops, size. I can spell. Um, I don't even know if you can read. Probably ought to write a little bit bigger. All right, so if n is the size of this pool, again, n by n pool, we came up with the table, n, and then in our other column, we called it f of n, and f of n was our name for the, the number of blocks that went around the outside. So when n was one, we said there would be eight blocks. When n was two, it was 12 blocks. And when n is three, there are 16 blocks. All right, so uh, let me get back to the comments here. I'm curious. Again, I can see people are already anticipating this question. What if there are four? Is it a four by four pool? What would the next number be here? And I'm seeing people enter 20. You are absolutely correct. And my guess is some of us took the time to carefully draw it out and just count the number of squares. But I also suspect some of you didn't even take the time to draw another square. You instead looked for a pattern. So let's look. Was there a pattern here? 8, 12, 16, 20? What's happening each time? It looks to me like those numbers are going up by fours. So we don't count by fours very often, but it's certainly doable. All right, so if that's the pattern, can we figure it out for five? The next number would be, that's right, 24. Huh, so really cool. But as a mathematician, I don't want to just know the answers to this problem. I want to know in general, what is this answer going to be? How many would there be if my pool was n by n? So we need to come up with some rule. So if I could maybe feed it to a computer or a calculator, and it would tell me the number of squares. For example, what if I was really ambitious and I built a pool that was 100 squares by 100 squares? Or about blocks. In, in, in Minecraft, so that would be 10,000 blocks. That would be a really big pool. But I've seen oceans that big in Minecraft. That, that happens all the time. And there's some very, very patient people. So what is the rule that goes with this? And I'm, so as I look in the comments and seen a few people with, with conjectures, and what I'm seeing is people writing things like four times n plus 1. So they're taking 1 more than n, and then they're multiplying by 4. So let, let, let's just check that real quick. If, so when n is 1, I take 1 more than 1, it's 2, and I multiply by 4. That works. 
when n is two, I take one more than two, which is three, multiply by four, it works. One more than three is four, and then I multiply by four, 16. This pattern works. So you, you've figured this out. So you're using pattern recognition to figure it out. Or maybe some of you instead looked at this problem geometrically. Maybe you looked at it and said, well, how many sides does a square have? There are four sides to a square, and each of those will require n different blocks. So that should be 4n just to get those, but there are also four corner blocks. So maybe you thought it would be 4 times n plus 4 more. And that is absolutely correct. Perfectly good way of arriving at the answer. So if, if you were able to recognize this pattern and hope to make predictions, kudos to you. And then let, let's answer that question. What if the pool was 100 by 100? Well, in that case, when n is 100, we needed to do 4 times 100 plus 4 more. And that will be 400 and 4. So now you know the number of blocks needed to, to cover the outside of a pool, to, to tile it. All right, so that was the answer to the last time's question. Today, I've got a slightly different Minecraft problem in mind. And before I even get to that, though, I have a story about a mathematician named Carl. Oh, sorry. Oh, I wanted to just say we should answer just a couple questions because you've got quite a few questions in there. Um, one popular one is, do you play Minecraft? Kids want to know. <laughs> so I, I have been known to, to play Minecraft, although you know what? I still haven't gotten very good at it. Uh, I'm at the stage where my kids are still making fun of me, but uh, yeah, they 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 go circles around us, and we have a hard time keeping up. But we do we do like Minecraft, indeed. And, and then this was a great question: What is my favorite form of algebra? Oh boy! So this question could be answered on a lot of different levels. Um, so algebra itself is we, we talked about it. You're defining variables they, they help you to solve mysteries so it's, it's about mathematics of, of mysteries and uh so, so i it turns out most math questions the, the, even the, the very difficult ones we don't know how to do difficult things in math even i don't know how to do difficult things all i really know how to do is turn difficult problems into easier problems so j just like when we're when you're multiplying you don't know how to multiply 372 times 95. What you, I don't know how to do that very well. Be, that'd be really hard. But instead, I can break it down into a bunch of smaller calculations that I'm able to do. And the, the, most of those calculations are just the basic multiplication tables, one through 10. And then I have to be able to add numbers. So if I can do that, then I'm able to solve the much harder problem. And so in math, with algebra, you're actually able to turn a hard problem into an easier problem that we do know how to solve. So you learn about things like linear algebra, so matrices. I teach a course called abstract algebra, which is a lot of fun. It has to do with the, these structures involving rotations and symmetries of objects. So um, there's a topic called abstract algebra that I like a lot. Um, but yeah, maybe not easy to define what the different types of algebra even are. And then one one more question before we go on to the next one. I thought this was a great one. So what if you have an irregular size pool? Okay, so what if we had an irregular size pool? All right, I'm gonna actually answer this one, even though I'd much rather assign you guys to work on it, but I can't really follow up with you that well. All right, so what if the pool here was M units long, but N units wide? So we're using two different variables here. And, and sometimes you, you actually want to just plug in specific numbers. You're like, well, what if it was six by three? See if we can answer that question, but I'm just gonna do it here in general. Well, along this side, I would need M different ones. Up top, I'd need M different blocks. Here I would need N blocks. Here I would need N blocks plus four more corner blocks. So in that case, we would get there were two M's plus two N's plus four more. So this is how we might tackle a rectangular pool. So very good question. 
All right. So I'm going to tell you about Carl Friedrich Gauss. He lived back in the 18th century, uh, which is a little weird. I always thought this was interesting. The 18th century is the 1700s. Isn't that weird? It, why, that messes me up all the time. Yeah, I why, always make mistakes. Why would that. the 18th century be the 1700s? Aren't they off by, by a number? Like, for example, what century do we live in right now? This is the 21st century. Shouldn't it be the 20th century? Go to the 2000s? And it, it turns out now time starts at zero, but we wanted to count that as the first century. So, yeah, the ordinal number there is actually always related to one more than the century numbers year. So we're the 21st century now. All right, so Gauss was a schoolboy. Um, it was probably maybe 11 years old. And this was back in the day when they just had little tiny writing slates. Each of the students would have one, like a mini chalkboard. They'd have it at their desk and then they would have to write on that chalkboard and do all their calculations. And the teacher wanted to keep his students busy for a while. So he gave them a math problem. And here was the math problem. He wanted one plus two plus three plus four plus all the way up to 100. He wanted them to add up the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to 100. So the teacher is like, ha ha, giving them that problem. That should keep them busy for a while. So then he went back to his desk to maybe do some work or read a book or whatever it was teachers were doing back then. Before they had phones. Yes, yeah, that's right. Without, without phones, you had to work a little harder to entertain yourself. Well, about 10 seconds after he sits down, young Gauss comes up and sets his slate on the teacher's desk. And the teacher looks at him annoyed, and Gauss goes back and sits down, and ah, teachers, ah, kids are supposed to work hard, and he didn't even work hard, and just, just gave up away, right away. Well, and eventually all the class finishes the calculations, and the teacher's going through the little slates, and he's grading them, and says, ah, wrong, wrong, ah, wrong. And then he gets to the bottom one, which is Gauss's slate, and he looks at it, and he's got the right answer. And the teacher's like, what? The, how in the world could he have figured that out so fast? So this is actually going to be my challenge problem for you guys today. See if you can find the answer to this question. And yeah, don't, don't use a calculator. See, see if you can do it without a calculator. But even if using a calculator, that could be kind of a long calculation. It might be really tough to type in all the numbers, right? But I, OK, this is actually a Minecraft question. You just didn't know it. So in this case, we're going to be building a staircraft out of blocks. Stair, staircraft. Staircase. Yeah. staircase. Staircase. All right. <clears throat> so this staircase is going to have one step. But then for the next one, we've got to go up two steps. And then this one's got to be three blocks high. And so on. And if we were to take this and make it be 100 blocks high, so over 100 blocks, up 100 blocks, what we would get is a different version of this same question. So we had 1 plus the 2 in this column, plus the 3 in this column, plus the 4 in the next column, and we could go all the way up to 100. So the question is, how many blocks in a staircase of height oh, n. So in this case, n is going to just be the height of the staircase. You can use whatever variables you want. You could name your variable Bob if you want, and it will still make sense. But n kind of sounds like number. N for number, it makes sense. Use a little bit of imagination. All right, and in order to solve a problem like this, we'd probably want to start with some smaller cases. We, we don't want to add these up. It takes a long time. So what we would do in this case is, I, I'm going to make a function, but so I want to answer the question for some small cases. And we're going to let, we're going to call the answer some, some functions. Let's use G. Last time I used F. We'll use G. 
So g of n is the number of blocks. Okay, and this, let's see if we can make a table of values just like we did for the last one. So, all right, so I've got my table here, n and g of n. All right, help me out here, science mom. When n is one, so in that case, I've only got one column here. What is g of n? One, you have one block. Very good. When n is two, so we've only got two columns. Then you need, are you asking me to count both, like one, two, three? That's exactly what I'm ah. asking you to do. So you get three total blocks. So your, your pyramid, whoops. Okay. Someone needs to go back to art school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let me dispose of that evidence. Where's my... There, I've, got a, I've got a glove I can use. There, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> you guys didn't see nothing. All right. All right. When N is three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six is correct. And then since I've already drawn it out here, what happens when N is four? Ten. Ten blocks. There are ten blocks. That's right. So that. So now, should they be looking for trying to find a pattern? Is that kind of the best way to try to find what the function is? What advice would you give? So that there are multiple approaches one could take here. Um, but yes, one should be looking for some type of pattern here. Um, just clear up a little bit of space here. So I want to, to draw this out. Because, yeah, we, we want to deal with the case. What happens when we get over n blocks? And it's not terribly easy to, to see what's going on here. So the, I, I will point out that I could <clears throat> do some rearranging. I could take these three blocks, and I could have put them over here instead, cross those out, and then I get something that might be a little bit easier to count. So that, that's my hint that I'm going to give you guys. Maybe there's some way of rearranging or regrouping the blocks that will help you to count the number of blocks in the staircase. But I also have a different question for you. So we had just answered another question. We had something we called f of n, which we defined to be the number of blocks in the border of a pool that was n by n. Let's see if we can remember what those numbers were. I think it was 8, 12, 16, 20, and so on. So my question for you is, which number is going to be bigger, f of n or g of n? Will the g of n's ever catch up to the f of n's? Because the f of n values are here, are bigger. Will the g of n values eventually catch up? If so, at what value of n? And yeah, so it's a, kind of an interesting question when you're comparing two functions that may or may not be, be related and talk about how they're growing, what their growth rates are. That's a great question. So. Good luck seeing if you can figure out the number of blocks in that staircase that's 100 blocks high. Very nice. Give a little round of applause, virtual round of applause for Math Dad. And before we, before we take, because there were a couple, couple questions that, um, that Science Mom Krista and Science Mom Liza have sent me that we should answer. But before we take those, I will answer one that has been popping up a bit, and that is, why aren't we wearing green? It's St. Patrick Day. The reason why I'm not wearing green is because I looked in my closet today and realized, huh, I don't even have a green shirt. I don't have anything green to wear. But I drew a clover on my hand with a dry erase marker, and that means I can pick ah, that dad. Ah. <laughs> that was me. You're welcome. <laughs> Does anybody have a math question for math dad? We'll have just a few math questions before we go on to our next our next portion. So any math questions? Math questions for Math Dad. I have a math question for you. Yes. Just for fun. Let's see how fast you can do an arithmetic problem. What is 1,024 times 50? Oh, goodness. 
that would be 51,200. Anyone want to check and see if he's right? I actually don't know. I have to pull up my phone. <laughs> okay. Was that right? Or did you no. just... Oh, no, no, no. We, we don't need to check. We, we, don't, <laughs> we don't need to, to check. Uh, that's, that's the secret with, with math problems is you don't... You just sound confident? You, yeah, just say the answer and then they'll just trust you. That, that 1,024 right. times 50 is 51,200. Is that what you said? That's what I said. Awesome. Yeah. All right. I'm going to check the chat real quick and see if we have any specific math questions for you. What? Um, so, oh, so man, I, they're I, coming up so fast. Yeah. So actually, let, let me tell you guys about a magic trick science mom and I used to do. So I, I was I'm pretty good with, with numbers. And so we, we would go around if we were visiting, say, her, her parents or just some friends. So I would look at we would look at the clock and see what time it was. So right now I see that the, the time is 920. All right. So then I would say, hey, science mom, what's 31 squared minus the, I don't know, the square root of 1681? And that's 920. That's right. And so she, she, she would say the answer and they'd be like, wow, Jenny, you're so good at math. And then they'd pull out their phones and check. They'd be like, how'd you know that? Way to go, science mom. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really just because he was so good at looking at the time and being like, ah, oh, 920, we could get there by doing this. So that was a fun little joke we used to play on our family members. Yeah, and of course I wouldn't ask the question until I knew what the answer was. Yep. yep. Um, a couple, a couple quick math questions that I think are really great that we'll answer. Um, Emily asks, um, or Coraline asks, what is the shape with the most sides? All right, it's, it's a really good question. So we've got the like, triangles have three sides, or rectangles or quadrilaterals have four sides, pentagons five. Hexagon six, so it just keeps going. So a seven-sided figure is a heptagon. An eight-sided figure? Octagon. A nine-sided figure? Nonagon. A nonagon, that's correct. A 10-sided figure? Probably decagon. De decagon. Decagon, okay. Yeah. All right, an 11-sided figure. I have no idea. Actually, I don't need it. But okay, <laughs> so, so, so what, what, do, what do they start doing when, oh, this thing's got 37 sides. What do we call that? Well, what we actually end up calling it is a 37 gone. So you do 37 dash gone. So in, in that case, we're talking about n gons or 100 gone or 1,000 gone. You can actually talk about those figures and you don't need to give them fancy names with, with Latin roots. So what's the figure with the most sides? There isn't one. Which is the same That would be the same as asking a question of what number is the biggest number? Huh. I was totally going to say circle. That was my guess. But I guess yeah. a circle doesn't have sides, right? Okay, so that's a good question. Does a circle have sides? It's going to kind of depend on how you're going to define things. So you're kind of involving a limiting process. You're getting into the ideas that will be discussed in a calculus class at that point. And yeah, so how many sides does a circle have? I, I, I think you could try to answer that many ways. Some people would claim, well, it's just one big side, one curvy side. Um, but I would probably have defined the of a polygon. You're actually talking about straight edges. And in that case, a circle actually isn't a polygon. So if the question was about polygons, eh, there isn't a largest polygon. Very nice. Very nice. We did. We had another question. How did you guys figure that out so fast? Which I think is a good one. And for you, I would say, is practice a good answer? You, you, you do math a lot because you teach math, right? I, I do teach math a lot. So I... I, I have a few things memorized. So when I was a kid, I was always fascinated with doubles. So I, so I, I think one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. So I, I know my powers of two really well. And, and you counted all the way up to a thousand one time for fun when you were a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I do enjoy the numbers. Um, we have a question: How many digits of pi do you know? Oh gosh, uh, probably about twenty. 3.14159265358979323846264 yeah so <laughs> wait yeah several people ask that say as many digits of pi as you can <laughs> those are those are some great <laughs> great great comments no. um what grade does math dad teach math dad teaches college and then we have had several people ask what your channel is and if you have a youtube channel if you'll start a youtube channel if you'll start a gaming Minecraft channel had some fun fun comments. <laughs> well, that, that that would be fun. So I actually have posted several math videos, but I do it on Science Mom's channel. So she's the one that's doing this full time. I actually have a 
whole nother job, but I have some, some math videos and some of the topics from those videos we're going to try to share during our, our quarantine. And we also have several videos where I, I just do, do a challenge, math dad versus science mom, where I would give science mom a problem where she would have to try to solve it live. And she, she's, she's very brave. She, she did pretty well. <laughs> And then um, one last question we had on math that I think was fantastic was how long has math been around? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, just about as long as people have. So, I mean, uh, math, you don't have to get really fancy. And it's often we're doing showy problems, but anytime you're doing, you're counting, you're comparing things, or when you're just tr trying to decide whether something's true or false based off of logic, that's when you're doing math. So math has been around about as long as people have been around, as long as, long as people have been, been counting things. Now, we've discovered a few things. Like, for example, if you go back for far enough, people didn't know about the number zero. They definitely didn't know about negative numbers on, or, or even the numbers that can't be written as fractions, so that the, the decimal numbers. So a lot of things have been discovered or invented, if you'd prefer. But. Very nice, very nice. All right, we are getting close to, close to, let's see, got to pull up our, our little schedule here. So we had our math dad, our Minecraft math, and now we have what's in the bag. So if you have our little um, quarantine handout, then you have a little head start on other people because you've got two of the clues already. But I'm going to see if math dad can guess what I have in this bag. The first clue is I change colors. Okay, what changes colors? Well, food coloring changes other things, colors. Uh, uh, you don't have a chameleon. We don't have a chameleon around the house. The second clue is insects love me. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, flowers do, fl flowers change color, right? So uh, they, they do, but it's not a flower. Oh, uh, insects love me. Sun. Sunday. The third clue is that people jump in me. People jump in me. Oh, this is a good one. You've got something in your bag and people jump in you. It changes color and, and insects, insects like it. Yes. Do you have a puddle in your bag? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not a puddle. Uh, oh, I should, hey, help me out, guys. What, to, what to be more accurate, <laughs> I, should, I should say that people jump in piles of me. Piles of you. Uh, yep. uh, oh, leaves. It's a leaf. <laughs> it's a leaf. It's a uh, leaf. Oh, thank you, guys. You rescued me. <laughs> <laughs> it is a leaf. And the leaf that I have here is from a pothos, from a houseplant I have. And it is variegated, which means it has sort of this alternating coloring of some parts a little bit more yellow, some parts green. And this leaf doesn't, um, they, it's evergreen all the time until the plant decides that this leaf is done, and then periodically leaves will turn yellow and then drop off the plant. And so it doesn't drop its leaves like a tree does in the fall, an deciduous tree, but these leaves still do change color because when they are old enough, they will kind of go yellow and drop down. Nice work. Thanks. Good job, good job bailing them out there, you guys. Go team, go team. <laughs> and then before we, before we share the drawing challenge for next time, I'm going to come to the whiteboard and just like last time, I'm going to answer a few more science questions and talk a little bit more about the awesome electricity things that we did at the beginning. I've got to kind of move this way. One question I'm going to ask Math Dad to sort of come over here and keep an eye on the chat so that he can tell me some of the questions you guys are asking. One of the questions that did come up is what is my favorite type of science? So Math Dad is an algebraist. He loves algebra. I really like all types of science, but if I had to pick a favorite, ooh, that's hard. Um, but I think it would either be chemistry or geology or ecology. Can I pick three? Three favorites? <laughs> and now let's talk just a little bit more about electricity. So we're going to do just like a quick recap of some of the cool stuff we learned about electricity today. So everything is made of atoms, and the green is not very visible, so I'm going to switch over to the black. Everything is made of atoms, and atoms have a center that is made of protons and neutrons. And these particles are pretty big, and the neutrons don't have any charge. The protons are positive. So here's a little plus sign for our nucleus. And then around the outside, and these electrons, they actually 
sometimes you'll see them drawn as like little tiny balls orbiting like a planet, but they exist in like these kind of electron clouds. And we can't know exactly where an electron is at any given time. We just have where it most likely is. So here are little electrons. I'm gonna draw them as a little E with a little negative sign. We have our little electrons orbiting around the atom. And like we said earlier, electrons are really kind of cool because they can, they can come and go in ways that the other parts of the atom can't. If you take away one of the neutrons, you still have the same element, but it's a different isotope. If you take away one of the protons, new element, new element. So if you have helium, a helium atom that has two protons and you take one of them away, it's no longer helium, now it's hydrogen. Every single atom of the element that we know of, if you remove a proton, then you change the element, take away a neutron, it's still the same element, it just is gonna act a little differently. Take away the electron, and that's not as big of a change. So certain elements, they can receive and donate electrons without really changing very much, and that's one of the reasons why insulators are such good, so good at building up charge, because they can absorb and kind of handle having a lot of little extra electrons. And any time you have extra electrons, like on our balloon, so here is our balloon. I erase this right here. So when you rub the balloon with a blanket, you get all of these electrons building up on the balloon. You get that negative charge, and then if you rub that piece of plastic that we had from the grocery bag, then you get negative charge there as well. And just like with magnets, Negative and negative repel each other, and that is what makes that ring float above the balloon. So quick little recap about our static electricity experiment and demonstration, and then we've got a couple questions to answer. Why does electricity travel through water? That is a great question, and it has to do with um, the attractions that you have in water. So water is a polar molecule. You have a slightly negative portion up here where the top of the oxygen is, and then you have slightly positive down here where the hydrogens are. And because you have this polarity with more negative charge here, more positive charge here, if you have a little ion, like maybe a little calcium ion here, then you are going to end up with an area that is a really great spot for an electron to travel through. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but I hope it helps just kind of spark an idea for how water is such a good conductor of electricity, and it has to do with charges, the charges that water naturally has. What would happen if you made the lightning quarters and put another quarter over the first? That is such a good question. I think we should try it. Ooh, actually, I know what would happen. So the, when the charge goes into that top quarter, the reason why it goes there is because I'm holding the quarter. If we had that quarter suspended from maybe a rubber band, something that did not connect to conduct electricity at all, I don't think that the charge would jump. It's because I'm holding it and I'm a conductor and then the charge is gonna ground. It's gonna go through my arm and down to the ground. That's why it works. So if I had another quarter on top, there would be no jumping between the quarters. That's a great question. What would happen if you put the quarter and the light bulb on at the same time? The, there's enough um, excited electrons going off around the plasma bowl that it would still light up. And in fact, maybe we can maybe we can try that real fast. Let's turn off the lights again. We'll bring our plasma ball back out real quick, and we will do a couple final experiments with our plasma ball before we finish. And we're going to finish with our drawing assignment for tomorrow. So here is our plasma ball. Turn it on. Why don't you just go ahead and bring the Bring the laptop right down here. So here we have our plasma ball. And again, this is such a cool machine. And the reason why we're seeing all these beautiful lights is because that ball is full of neon and argon gas. And now I just need to find where I put my quarters. Hmm. Quarter, quarter. The leprechaun back. came and got him. You know, I think we did have some. We had leprechauns, sneaky leprechauns. Might be in that box there, maybe. Huh. So as you saw before, if we bring this light bulb close, we don't have to get all the way there. That's where we start to see it lighting up. And then the closer we get, the more it lights up, but we start to get some light all the way back here. That's pretty far away. We're pretty far 
from our from our bulb. And if I put a quarter on and then bring this light bulb close, it's not much different than it is if I just bring the light bulb close without the quarter. And now, if Math Dad will help me out, we can try the double stack with the quarter and a penny. So we'll put the penny here. He'll hold that one on. There's our lightning. I'll hold this one above. No lightning with the second one. And I know with our resolution here and having a laptop camera, that little bolt of lightning I think is pretty hard to see. If we get as close as we possibly can and then hold it towards the front of the coin, I, hopefully you can see that. There's a, a bit of a reflection off of that penny, but there is a little bolt of purple lightning. These plasma balls are so much fun, and I really love the way that the way that you get the different patterns and you can make it follow your finger. I think my favorite thing to do is to put both fingers up here and then split them apart until you get that like tug of war back and forth. And you can see that with two points of contact and they're both great con conductors, there's sort of this random motion where the electrons are alternating from one to the other. And I think that's a lot of fun. If you touch it with all of your fingers at the same time, I have the power. Then you get, you know, going to multiple fingers. And then sometimes people will say, when I do this at schools, if you put your hand on it, they'll say, oh, I can see your skeleton. You're not actually seeing the skeleton. What you're seeing is just the connection point, you know, where your skin is touching. But sometimes if you have your whole hand on there, you do kind of, it kind of looks, looks kind of bright, like maybe you're seeing the bones, but you're not. So question about, can you charge a balloon? Can you charge a balloon Here's on a plasma ball? That is a fantastic question. Let's try it real fast. I'm gonna put on my gloves. I did see one question in the comments saying, if you have a latex allergy, what can you do? And I actually have a latex allergy. I'm, it's latex sensitivity. I'm not really dangerously allergic, but I will get a rash if I touch balloons. And so that's why I'm putting on mittens, but a pair of cloth mittens works really well. So first, if Math Dad will come over here a little bit closer, let's just demonstrate that this balloon is not charged. If, I don't know if they could see. It's not, it's not sticking to Math Dad. It is not sticking to our cloth here. It does not have a charge. And if we place it on our plasma ball and hold it here, the question is, is it gathering electrons? Is it getting a charge? Now let's test it. I think it's getting a very small charge because I felt like there was just a little bit of resistance there, but it's very, if there, if it is getting charge at all, it's hardly any, hardly any. We're getting a lot of requests for leprechauns. Did, can you download that file? Or do, did you send Ooh. it? Um, if not, I'll go send it. Request for leprechaun traps. You know what? We will actually end with a video. And I think what might work best, Math Dad is gonna send me a file that we made. We made a file that has a short little three minute video showing several different leprechaun traps that were sent in because they were just fantastic ones. So we'll play that in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to show you the drawing assignment for next week and then tell you if you want to see more leprechaun traps and more mixed up animals and the great creations that have been coming in, go to Facebook and on Facebook, if you, um, if you go to the post that we made on the Science Mom Facebook page, then you can find lots of great drawings. And then you can also use the hashtag quarantine or Science Mom Squad and share your work there. And I'm gonna bring, do you want to play it on the other computer? Okay. I'm going to mute myself. Are, are, are we at the end or are, are there more questions? I'm gonna remove Math Dad. And I'm going to show you the, I'm going to do the drawing assignment and then we will play the video. So we are going to end just a few minutes early today, I think. So here is our drawing assignment for next time. Whoa, actually it looks like, it looks like I did not, this is a little embarrassing you guys. It's been a very busy day for me. It looks like I did not put it up on, um, on into here yet, but I did post it to Patreon. So if you head over to Patreon, you will see the drawing challenge for tomorrow. So head over to Patreon. That first post there has the drawing challenge for tomorrow, which is to draw the view out your window 
and then add a fantastic element. Add something unusual and unexpected. And it could be something like a unicorn or a dragon or a Pokemon or a magical creature, or you could do something like Wacky Wednesday. In fact, I'm going to ask Math Dad, could you find the Wacky Wednesday book real fast? It's on the front shelf and bring it in. Have you seen, just tell me in the chats really quick, Have you, if you've seen Wacky Wednesday by Dr. Seuss. Wacky Wednesday by Dr. Seuss was one of our kids' favorite books when they were little. It is such a fun book. And in the Wacky Wednesday book, you start out with this person waking up and they look on the wall and there's a shoe on the wall. Will you turn on the light for us real quick? Thank you, darling. So he wakes up, there's a shoe on the wall. That's wacky. That's not supposed to happen. And then in every single picture, there are more wacky things happening. So your a drawing assignment for tomorrow, you could do something magical or you could just do something wacky because it is Wednesday tomorrow. Wacky Wednesday is a fantastic book. And a fun thing to do is to count how many wacky things you do and then challenge someone else to find them. So, so in, in this one, I see a worm is chasing a bird. That's very wacky. The hose is cut off. There's a ban bananas growing in the apple tree. So those are our three wacky things in this one. And in every single picture, there are more wacky things. And once you get up to like 20 wacky things, it actually can be pretty challenging to find them all. And it's a really fun little, fun little book and a great drawing exercise for tomorrow. So that's what we'll be showcasing tomorrow. And then were you, did you have luck finding the... I've got, got the file. Got the do, file? You, do you know how to put it on? Yeah, I will I, just bring you into the stream and we'll play it. Let's do that. I don't know. Do you know how to share, mm -hmm. play a file from my desktop, share desktop? Yeah, with QuickTime? I, I can I can have your screen yeah. and it'll play. Okay, so I, I, why don't you jump over there? Okay. I, I will add you. But I, I, there was one, one question about what are the different types of math? And that was a really good question. There are lots of different subjects. So... As you progress, so that after you finish arithmetic, where you're working with the numbers, you'll get to uh, algebra. So we, we talked about algebra, where you're starting to use variables. So you're solving mysteries using letters as your numbers. It's kind of an interesting change. Definitely very different than anything you've done before. Then you'll get up to geometry in high school, where you're actually studying geometric figures and the way that things work in the plane, you'll be proving things. It's a whole new type of logic. Some students who felt that they were never great at math love geometry and it works really well for them. And there's some students who thought, oh, math is my jam, I'm not really good at this. Sometimes they struggle with geometry, it's a little bit harder. It's different than anything they've ever done. Um, but like most things, if you put in enough time, you'll get good at it. All right, science mom muted me. Ah. <laughs> um, okay, then in, in, as you go up in high school, you'll get to the trigonometry. So you do more algebra, you get some trigonometry, which has to do with the study of angles. And then you get all the way up to calculus, where you're able to do mathematics with curves and answer some really interesting questions about the slopes of curves. Maybe you'll minimize and maximize functions. Maybe find the area underneath some weird curve shape. So that's what you get through in high school. After high school, there are still more math classes that you can have. And most people, unfortunately, they, they don't get to, to go beyond calculus. The, if, if you're not going into the sciences, you usually don't need to continue on in math. But um, they're missing out on a lot of fun, in my opinion. So to get up to topics like linear algebra, we got discrete math. So combinatorics, abstract algebra, analysis, topology. Oh, okay. oh. I think I'm ready to try this. All right. So add you to the stream. Yes. And then, all right. So we are now in our front room. And what I'm going to try to do is share my screen, which I have not done before. And we will see if it works. Hopefully you guys will be forgiving if it if it doesn't um your entire screen screen one share oh you know what we, we haven't given it permission 
So we'll, we will have to share this video on Facebook because it looks like it is not going to work today. But to, to end our little, um, to end our little discussion, I want to share the, a similar th thought to what I shared yesterday. So take a minute just to think about the incredible fact that you exist. You're not a tree, you're not a cat, you're not a dog, you're a human being and part of a human family. And this is an amazing thing. Something like a roll of duct tape is amazing too. And if I was on a deserted island for 50 years with all the natural resources I needed to make duct tape, do you think I could make duct tape? I don't think so. I, I, could you make a roll of duct tape? I could not. You'd have to make the machinery to make the cardboard tube that's on the inside. You would have to make the glue that goes on the inside of the tape and then all those threads that make the tape. That would be a real challenge if you were just one person. And if you had no internet, I don't think you could make duct tape, not even after 50 years of trying. But we can find duct tape in stores and it doesn't cost very much and we're able to get it, use it. And it is one of the most fantastic tools ever. And this is an amazing thing. Being part of a human family, being part of humanity is incredible. And we are so glad that you joined us today for this second day of quarantine. You can see that we're still sort of getting the feel for live streaming and we weren't able to share the little video we'd put together with sharing screens, but we'll figure out, we'll figure things out and get better and better as we go along. Do you want to say anything else to close? Keep up the, the artwork. It is so fun to see what you've come up with. You, you kids are amazing. You've blown me away. The artwork has been incredible and we, we don't want to keep it to ourselves. My inbox right now has more than 500 leprechaun traps in it and they are all fantastic. We want to share it with everybody. So share your artwork to our Facebook page. If you go to Facebook, then there is a drawing, a little post that just has the drawing prompt and you can put your leprechaun traps down in that drawing prompt, or you can post it and use the hashtag quarantine, post it on Instagram and tag us so that other people can see the amazing artwork that you're coming up with. And I can't wait to see what you draw outside your window tomorrow. We'll see you again tomorrow.